Welcome to Pakhaise Zwijger. Um, let's see, I need to find my position here in this room. Uh, quite an impressive uh, stage we have. Um, I'm going to get back to that later. Uh, but first of all, I, 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 um, I'm very happy that you're all here in such a large uh, amount as well, and even more coming. So welcome. Please uh, find yourself a, a seat. Um, tonight we're going to explore the, the influence of populism on our uh, democracy and our democratic system. Um, and we're all going to challenge you, the speakers, but also you in the audience to really try and think about the, the, the different sides that it could possibly uh, have. So we're going to explore the way in which populism could pose a threat to our democracy, uh, which is often uh, assumed by people uh, as, as, as one of the dangers eh, for our democratic system. Uh, but we're also going to explore the way in which it might be a way of democratic innovation and uh, a development that is maybe strengthening uh, our, our democracy instead of uh, uh, damaging or uh, threatening it. Uh, so for, for some people that might mean open up your, your mind a bit to a different possibility than what you already think. Uh, but not to make assumptions, I actually would, I'm actually quite curious. So who in this room, if you, if you raise your hand, uh, considers populism to be a threat to our democracy? you see, so that's quite a lot. Who uh, sees populism as at least the potential of uh, innovating our democracy? <laughs> and who says no, no potential, but it's full-blown democratic innovation? Okay, okay, then I pushed it too far. All right, um, <laughs> so um, uh, what we're gonna do is, well, first we're gonna, we're gonna hear a bit about um, uh, the reason why we're all here together, uh, which is a European uh, research project um, uh, done by the FU uh, called Free Connect. Um, uh, and we're gonna uh, then divide the evening in two parts. So we have this first part in which we look at the threats of populism on our democracy. And in the second part, we're gonna look at the potential for democratic innovation. Uh, both of those parts will be introduced by one of the researchers from the, uh, the ReConnect pro uh, project, um, who will share their personal and professional reflections on, on the work that they have been doing. And then we will um, uh, well join into a conversation with both academics, but also uh, people from either politics or the societal, uh, uh, societal organization. So we're really trying to uh, look at it from different perspectives. Uh, but throughout this entire evening, I really encourage all of you uh, to also join the conversation. So we don't see you that much as an audience, but we see you as participants. And that's also really in line of this series of events that we organize here at Pakhuis called New Democracy, in which we explore the ways in which our democracy is um, developing and transitioning. Um, and we, well, we thought if we're going to have evenings talking about democracy, then we should also make that conversation uh, inclusive and democratic. Uh, so we see all of you Actually, this room is full uh, and filled with speakers. So uh, we are very curious to also hear your opinions, your experiences, uh, and your expertise, because, um, well, so far in these 41 uh, editions, we already saw that a lot of people in the audience also have very valuable information to share. So again, welcome. It's great that you're here, because without you, this would be a very, well, non-democratic conversation, in a way. Um, we're going to start. So I'm going to invite Ben Krum uh, to the stage, uh, or, well, to the table. Um, and uh, Ben is a professor of political science at the FU and also the work package leader in the Interdisciplinary Horizon 2020 project Reconnect. Wor work package leader is already a very strange uh, title, I would say. Maybe you can explain it later. Uh, but Ben, please, yeah. take the floor. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to explain uh, the bureaucratic <laughs> structures of European research projects. Um, this, yeah, this is work. Um, so, um, so we're talking about, we need to talk about populism. Um, and 
of course, we, we observe Trump, we observe Brexit, we see Baudet, Orban, um, uh, Kaczynski, um, and it's easy in a way to, to think, well, there's something that they share, to, to, to lump them together as, as to talk about, well, there is a rise of populism across the Western world. Um, it's challenging our established political practices. Um, it uh, forces us to change the way that we think about democratic systems. Um, and it may be even threatening our uh, democratic systems. And for sure, of course, there are worrying things happening. And we will discuss a number of them uh, this evening um, in Hungary, I think it's very difficult to get Orban out of office for any opposition if it can still mobilize itself. In, in uh, Poland, uh, judges are, are being criminalized if they criticize their own government. Um, indeed, in the US, in the White House, we have somebody who uses government resources to further his own personal business agenda. Um, so, so there are things uh, to worry about. <laughs> but I think the way that we want to approach it this evening is also to, to look at populism not just as, as one bland movement, but to, to look at its differentiated uh, manifestations, how it's different in different contexts. Um, and there are different reasons why populism comes to the fore um, in different countries under different conditions. And above all, um, indeed, as, as Charlie already introduced, um, we think there's, there's more than just reason to worry about populism. There is a reason, I think, to, to think about where does it come from? What are the underlying causes? What does it say about our political system that it triggers this kind of responses? Where do they come from? What, what does it feed on? And also, indeed, of course, democracy is supposed to change. Democracy is supposed to renew itself. Democracy is to be open to new voices. And if society changes, then we need new political voices. So I think one of the underlying um, questions that we want to address this <laughs> evening is on the one hand, indeed, to look at populism as a really a very diverse phenomenon, but also as one that has the potential um, to operate in different directions and to, to think about how can we use this energy, um, this involvement of new people um, to strengthen our democracy. Now we organized this evening, uh, Charlie already mentioned it, as part of a, a, a European sponsored research project involving 18 universities from 14 countries. Um, it's uh, called Reconnect. It's very much about how can we yeah, reconnect the abstract political institutions that we have in Europe with citizens' experience. And how can we bring democracy and the rule of law, how can we kind of reinvigorate um, those two principles of our political order? Um, it's led by the University of Leuven, and I'm very happy that we have uh, two representatives uh, from Leuven here in the, in the room as well, um, because they really make help us and they do a lot of the shitty stuff while we get to discuss the, the fun stuff um, uh, among ourselves. Um, it's a very broad project, but our focus at the VU, at the Vrije Universiteit, where we work together with Alvaro Olia, with Patrick Overeem, with Bertjan Wouthuis, we very much focus on, on the issue of democracy and how democracy is evolving and indeed the challenges that it is facing in Europe these days. And that's where we want to focus also this evening. Um, as I said, we want to have an open debate uh, this, this evening. We hope that we all learn from different experiences. We all have our own experiences about how pol politics is changing, how uh, new forms of engagement are showing up, how new parties uh, mobilize themselves. Um, and we also want to, so we want to get insight in those different experiences. And I think that for that we have a wonderful lineup with people who have insight experiences in, to, in different systems across Europe uh, and who, who can tell their own stories about that. But we also want to reflect upon that. What is the potential? Where is this going? Uh, what are the opportunities? And uh, indeed, how do we spot the threats when they're there? And how can we mobilize uh, against those? Because in the end, um, what we care about here is indeed um, to have a lively and engaging democracy, both indeed in the political system as well as um, in the setting that we have this evening. So I hope you have a very informative and lively and engaging evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ben, yeah, please stay with me just for a little bit uh, because you did touch upon it in, in your talk, but um, uh, populism is, well, occurs in so many different forms and on so many different sides of the, of the spectrum. Uh, so just to, to have that really clear for the rest of the evening, um, uh, if you would have to explain 
the definition of populism or the concept of populism that we're, we're looking at today, well, how would you uh, do that? Well, there, there's a very long, of course, academic debate about how we define populism. But and but we're going for the, for the, for the for accessible broad, one. We go for a very broad definition. And that's mm -hmm. basically that populist parties, populist people who, who appeal to populism, appeal to the people and say something is missing in the political system that we have. And we want to bring the, the voice of the people into that political system again. Um, um, and that means indeed that, that the main divide that you create is very much between an established political class, an established political elite, and a new movement from the ground yeah. that is there to reinf reinvigorate uh, the political uh, system. Yeah. And that, can that doesn't have to be right-wing, it doesn't have to be left-wing, it can be straight to the middle actually, maybe Macron is a populist, uh, but I think the focus that we have is very much this challenge in the name of, 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 of a sense of exclusion, that, that new people have to get access to the political system and that the political system as it is doesn't sufficiently allow for that yeah. at this stage. Yeah. Okay, so, but the, the, the things that you often hear in the media, I will get to you in a second, the things that you often hear in the media are often a, a, a populist, they, they hate the elite, they're anti the establishment, uh, but in that sense, that's often connected to the more right wing, uh, in at least that's what gets a lot of attention in the media, but you're saying, no, we're looking at it as uh, a m actually a, a movement that is opposing the system and the way it's working now. They say it's lacking something, and we are here to add something. To bring the people to in bring again, the yeah, people yeah, yeah. And that's, of course, a, a grander claim than just we're bringing in a particular interest. So it's, it's really yeah. bringing in the people. But yeah. yes, I mean, of course, the obvious examples, we don't have them that much in, in, in the Netherlands. I mean, you could argue that maybe the Socialist Party is, is a populist party, but, but the typical examples in Southern Europe are, of course, mm -hmm. Syriza, Podemos, Mm -hmm. uh, left-wing parties that, that really say, well, we want to break the mold of the established parties and bring in a more authentic voice into the political yeah. debate. Yeah. Okay, I saw a, a hand rising already. So you took, you took my advice at hand, that's great. If you can please just briefly uh, introduce yourself. Okay, my name is uh, Jan Pieck, I'm just a concerned citizen, and I deeply object against the term, the voice of the people. There was no such thing as the voice of the people. There are thousands of opinions in, in the Netherlands, in, in millions of opinions in Europe. Populists to cl claim to speak th for the voice of the people or to be the voice of the people is rubbish. They only represent a small fraction. Okay, great. That's a very important statement indeed. Uh, 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 can I just add a nuance to that? Yeah. Because I, I think that's... In a way, of course, it's correct. Every politician always has a constituency. And, and, but the funny thing is, of course, what political parties do more than interest groups is also to say, well, um, I want to appeal to the public at large. So in that sense, I think every politician cannot just say, well, I'm just fighting for my constituency. No, I fight for the society to make it better. Uh, so there's always an appeal that's a bit bigger, maybe, than what they stand for. And I think that's inherent uh, to politics to some extent. Um, well, but yes, I think there is a danger. There is a danger to the extent that you yeah. say, I speak for the people, and any other voice cannot be legitimate because I'm already talking for the people. So that's, I think, where, where, where we get in the dangerous edges. And I think that's what we have to discuss. Yeah. How do we spot the difference? And where, does, where do we go get off track? Yeah. But we can also maybe, maybe explore whether uh, not only the populist, but also the non populist parties are, in fact, claiming to speak for this. This, this broader group uh, and not only their own constituencies. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start uh, with the first panel. So, um, uh, that, that's going to dive into uh, the, the concern, right? So, we're going to look at um, uh, whether populism can pose or is posing a threat to our democracy. Um, and uh, to do so, as I told you, we're going to ask one of the, um, uh, the researchers in this project to share her personal and uh, but also professional observations um, uh, to, to introduce this, this topic to us. And then we're gonna uh, join uh, with a couple of others on stage to explore this further. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask Barbara Graboschka Moroz to please come forward. She's a postdoc researcher at the University of Groningen. Um, Barbara, the mic's the water. Uh, you have the next uh, uh, couple of minutes. Um, 
to to share your story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me um, ha having me here. I want to start with some um, definitional remarks that we understand populism and democracy in the same way. Um, I will stick to the um, Jan uh, Werner Miller definition of, of, of populism, meaning something which is um, concentrated on anti-pluralism -plural idea and also on the exclusion of certain groups of the society. This is how I understand the, the populist idea. And the democracy, how I feel it, is, um, is a way of participation in public decision making. And having said that, um, I just want to mention that my personal and, and professional experience is mostly based on my previous work that I have done in Warsaw and Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. What we were doing, we are um, conducting a monitoring of the legislative process. I mean, we have seen so many ministers of justice trying to reform the judiciary that we actually decided we need to follow up those ideas and check how this law works um, works in practice. So the main idea of democracy from my professional perspective was actually to look for a way to participate in a public dis discussion about the law that is going to be um, uh, going to be um, um, introduced. Sometimes we also had the feeling that we also represent the underrepresented uh, underrepresented people, meaning you know people who are in jail, someone who is kept um, um, who is um, um, doesn't have access to any kind of public um, media, or his voice, his or her voice is just not, not, not heard. So, in some extent, the civil society plays the role of making some arguments being more visible. And that's what we are trying to, um, trying to um, do. So, looking from from this perspective, um, the public decision making process has usually didn't end when the law was adopted. It actually was followed up later on before the, the Constitutional Tribunal. You probably heard about the whole discussion and whole the constitutional crisis in Poland. Um, a week ago, 22 former judges of the Constitutional Tribunal actually announced that there is no tribunal at all in Poland right now. So that right now the institution is fully captured, is fully loyal um, to the government. So from this perspective, thinking about the decision-making process became much um, much shorter. You don't have a place that you can present the voice of someone who wasn't heard before uh, in front of the impartial um, court. This option uh, has unfortunately um, uh, gone. Um, and also I think um, th the role of the tribunal at that moment was actually to make the law a living instrument and to make the debate much more engaging from those people who are not engaged in, in, um, in, in politics. Um, but it, also, it was also possible, and this will be a little bit of legal remark, it was possible because law was, was foreseeable. You know what were the options on the table. You know what options could be used and how can be uh, applied uh, in practice. So having that in mind, the question is what has changed? And I, I prepared just four examples of the situations which made the whole situation different. And I, s and I f think this is the result of the populist um, uh, agenda taking place in, in, um, in Poland. First of all, consultations, the public consultations of draft law was actually taken off from the table. There is no obligation of the, of the consultation. So the law is being passed very quickly. You can, uh, you probably heard about um, a so-called IPN law, the, 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 the law which, um, um, made uh, actually historical research much more challenging in Poland because if you uh, said something bad about the Polish history, you might be charged with criminal um, with criminal charges. So the law was firstly adopted in um, February last year, and then it was amended within four hours, together with the signature of the of the of the president. So consultation is not needed. You don't have access to make a public um, decision. The second thing was um, arbitrariness of the public uh, decisions taken by the by the executive. So it was possible for the government to say, we will not publish the constitutional tribunal rulings. That's all, you cannot do anything about it. Um, the third thing is offensive language, but not just against individuals, but actually against institutions, meaning judiciary as an example. So um, judiciaries, for instance, uh, presented uh, as a, judgeocracy, which is something opposite to democracy. So um, we can hear from the uh, Minister of Justice saying, 
that by passing the strict law against judges, we made democracy win over judgecracy. Um, the, last, um, the last element which made the whole change, um, the whole game different, was public media who are captured by the government and who actually just pr present smear campaign against anyone who can be um, seen as a, as a threat, as an enemy of the, of the nation. And who can be the enemy of the nation? The NGOs can be, of course, paid by Soros, um, but also doctors and teachers because they protest for getting some rights from the, from the government, and of course, judges. Um, but th in this sort of pessimist picture, I can also see a huge space for social pressure and for social activism. And I can give you two examples which were very successful looking from, from the Polish perspective. The first one was so-called Black March in September 2016. So the very strict draft of, of anti-abortion law was proposed by the group of MPs. Um, and there were huge protests on the, on the streets. You've probably seen the, the pictures of women, but not also women, men also wearing black clothes on a very rainy day, uh, standing on the streets. Uh, and two days after, the, the, the draft was dropped. I mean, the parliament decided we cannot face such social pressure. We have to uh, drop this, um, this draft. And the second moment was in July 2017, when um, the new law on Supreme Court was supposed to be adopted. And the protests, there were constant protests for one week. And the, the president, after all, decided to veto the, um, the, the laws. And I remember my very good friend, uh, he's a professor of law, um, you know, believing in the letter of law that this is the, the, the most important thing. I remember when he called me and he actually said that the social pressure and the protests on the streets are the only things that can save us, save us, meaning lawyers, people who work in, this, um, in the Supreme Court. So that was extremely interesting example how um, how lawyers drop their ideas and actually um, look into um, social um, social pressure. But also, to make it happen, it needs to be protected and it needs to be somehow stimulated. The same protest did not happen half a year later when the same law was adopted by, by the parliament. Um, when, when you ask about potential of populism, is there anything good that makes uh, or gives hope uh, of, um, that populism can change something. Um, actually, the fact that people in Poland are wearing T-shirts with the name Constitucja, which makes the legal act something sexy, is unimaginable, I guess, in <laughs> any um, in any country. So this is, I think, something which gives potential. People understood that they have tool that they can use in public discussion. Is it effective, or how? much time you need to spend to, to make it effective. It's a different kind of discussion. But I think the level of awareness, what the Constitution is, really made, um, made the good lesson. I mean, we, I think we can um, put it on, on the table as a good side of what, what has happened. Um, however, coming to a conclusion, I have a feeling that being a lawyer is usually meaning being an optimist because you can see all the options on the, on the table. You know what's gonna happen. Sometimes you have to be creative, you know, to find those options, but more or less, you know what's gonna happen. And I think that the current crisis in Poland, what has made, is made lawyers more realistic, fortunately or unfortunately. Because you have to foresee that, for instance, the executive will say that your case, that the judgment in your case is going to be void and is going not to be accepted by the by the government, or is not going to be published, um, or that the, that the government will make up a full fake case against against you, just to make you quiet or um, just to have the ruling that they expect from the um, from the uh, captured um, institution. So um, I'm I'm going to leave the question open: How optimists can can we actually be uh, when we think about uh, Poland? I think we can be much more optimistic about Poland than about Hungary at the moment. Um, but right now, I think 
we, we need to just uh, look what is happening uh, and, and we'll see the question, but I guess it will not be today or tomorrow and we'll have to we look not on, to on, on, on a legal rulings, on the, on the judgments that are going to be passed, but actually um, at the actions uh, taken by the, by the society, including civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so you, you also touched upon it in your, in your talk, but if, if we just stated that the populist movement is representing the voice and then with the correction that that is already a quite a um, dubious claim to make um, the the social pressure and the social protest that you talked about is also a representation of the voice um, is that then maybe somehow also to be seen as a populist movement or not i don't think um, i mean um, the protest against something is much easier than protest in favor of something. Mm -hmm. You need, uh, you just need one common ground, and you have it. You protest against the law yeah. that is going to be, uh, going to be just wrong and and, uh, and bad in practice. Um, I think translating this um, this protest into something positive—that's something that is going to be uniting for the society. Yeah. Because right now the Polish society is extremely divided. You can, you have just two. Um, um, completely opposite groups. So if you are able to introduce a um, narrative that is going to be united, uniting for, 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 for the society, yeah. I guess that would be one of the possibil possibilities to yeah. overcome the populist challenge yeah. taking place right now in Poland. Yeah. So the two forces actually um, uh, were also igniting each other in a way. Right. I mean, you have you will have to discuss with with the ruling party yeah. uh, certain things. You you are not able just try or avoiding discussion with the half of the society. It's just impossible. Yeah, and not democratic. Any questions or remarks? I see a bit shy finger over there. <laughs> you can please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Ian Ito. Um, I was just wondering the populist movements in uh, Poland, but also in Hungary. Are they not more symptoms of evolution of the democratic society in Eastern Europe? That you just come out of an authoritarian system, communism. And I think it's from now almost maybe a bit more than 20, 30 years that you come from that uh, system. Is this just not a phase in a democratic uh, process that eventually you will more develop the same processes as society as Western Europe? Let, maybe we can save this one for the table because I would also be interested to see what the other two panelists say about that. Um, so Barbara, I, if I can already invite you to, to come up here, uh, I would also really like to invite uh, the former member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Green Party, uh, Judith Sargentini, to the stage. Please give her a warm welcome. Um, <laughs> And uh, assistant professor at the FUB Communication Studies Department, Benjamin De Klein. Benjamin, where are you? Yes, there you are. Please welcome into the stage. Yes. We're we're gonna still interact with the audience, so you're also gonna well twist around on your chairs. Uh, please feel free to take some water. Um, Yedid, if I may start with you, um, connecting to what Barbara just said, uh, that she's actually more optimistic about the situation in Poland uh, than in Hungary. Um, you have been uh, focusing uh, uh, quite, exten uh, quite extensively on the situation in Hungary. Uh, what, is, what would be your rea reaction to the story that she just told? Is, is, are there many similarities or do you see a, a very different uh, kind of development if you look at the Hungarian case? I think Barbara is right. Mm -hmm. uh, the situation in Poland is a lot more severe. I don't think it has anything to do with the word populism, though. It has to do with autocracy, uh, with kleptocracy, uh, but not necessarily with the word uh, populism. But what, mm -hmm. uh, what you see in Hungary is that um, democracy has been sliding down and rule of law has been sliding down severe for over 10 years right now, and Poland is only halfway, I would say. Uh, the, the Polish government takes its uh, examples from the Hungarian um, situation. 
where it touched upon everything in society, academic freedom, media freedom, um, um, uh, the judiciary, um, um, the space for political parties, space for civil society and NGOs. So the situation in Hungary is much more severe mm -hmm. than in Poland. But it has to do with rule of law and democracy. Because I got puzzled after the different introductions about populism. If indeed populism is, is defined as a, a non-pluralistic or anti-pluralistic, mm -hmm. then, then, then I get it and then we need to talk about the situation in Poland and Hungary. Um, but if populism is the Sardines movement in Italy, uh, yay, <laughs> then that would be fantastic. Yeah. So help me out here where you want to go. Well, um, I mean, I actually then have to, I think I will have to go back to Ben because you you introduce it as a very broad approach. But if you now hear this, this uh, specific uh, question, what would you say? Would you like to zoom in or? challenge the panel to stay stay broad? Um, well, we, we have a division of tasks, of course, between the different panels. But I think what, what is important here is to think that there's a general unease that some voices are getting lost in the political system and, and that some of the established voices don't pick up the whole uh, uh, sense of society of what we want from democracy. And some parties abuse that momentum and uh, turn into autocracies. Um, and others we don't know. And some may even be benign uh, and, and fit your own political agenda as well. Um, but I think that we're talking about a wider unease about the extent to which established parties succeed in really uh, keeping democracy alive. Um, and we see that indeed both benign and more malign voices jump into that void. And I think the question very much is how do we distinguish between those? Mm -hmm. How do we avoid that the sardines become in the end, if they would get to power, maybe just as autocratic? Um, as uh, as Orban. So, if my problem with populism mm -hmm. in the uh, anti-pluralistic uh, approach mm -hmm. is this: um, I'm not so worried about newcomers in the field that want to start a debate. Uh, not even if they are called Forum for Democracy, although you understand that is far from where I stand, or AfD in Germany. My problem is with those in the establishment that hard, that cuddle up to those uh, movements and start using the same vocabulary or doing the same uh, or, or or proposing the same ideas, but then in a light version. Yeah. Um, so the shift to the right in that sense. But the shift to the sim the right, yes, mm -hmm. but also the shift to the simple solution. Because um, uh, uh, Viktor Orban was not a newcomer, uh, and he, he is establishment, and he was actually a very promising liberal figure. We could, have s we could say now that we have never really paid enough attention on the nationalistic rhetoric that has always been there, but he's an arrivé, he's there. And he is within the European People's Party, which is Christian Democrats, which is, that which is the center of European politics. Or within our own country, when you see VVD, uh, the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. in power for a long time. How long do we have the same Prime Minister Rutte? For quite some time. That is adapting language that, for, for instance, now suggests, both Christian Democrats and Liberals, that it is okay to start cooperating in Brabant with uh, Forum for Democratie. That, I think... Is the popu that's the populism I'm afraid of. The, I that's the, the populist suge threat. In the, your su the suggestion that that you have simple solutions for very difficult proposals, mm -hmm. and that we're not willing to bring along our citizens any anymore. In the people were living in difficult times. We need new and solutions. Yep. Yep. And in your role, uh, former role as a, as a member of the European Parliament. Um, how how did you position yourself towards these developments? Uh, um, how did you uh, try and and at least bring bring awareness to, to these issues or keep your your colleagues uh, and and the colleagues of the other um, uh, European countries uh, sharp and active on this? Is that is that something that you uh, really uh, fought for in in your time there, or uh, how did you position yourself within this development? 
in such a... Well, yes, I, I think I did. Uh, but things need to get really severe mm -hmm. before people want to take, uh, want to draw the consequences. Mm -hmm. I started in 2009 working on media pluralism in Italy when Berlusconi was still prime minister and owning his own conglomerate. The response at that point of the majority in the House was pointing the finger. You tell us that we're no good, it's no good in Italy, look at Germany or look at your own country. Uh, simplifying again something that is actually very nuanced. Um, only 10 years after Viktor Orban came and, and Fidesz came back into power, there was a majority in the House to start acting and that was way beyond what was acceptable, and it was uh, academic freedom. That was the thing that made colleagues tick, yeah. but the position of civil society didn't really, or the, um, or the uh, sacking of, uh, of judges didn't really make yeah. a difference. So, but that's also the danger then of the backslide, democratic b backslide, that how far do you need to go? W when is something too far? And, and, and this gray area apparently uh, took took 10 years uh, to, to, to at least create some form of opposition then win within the European Well, Parliament. some form of opposition has always been mm -hmm. there. There was always a majority plus one to be critical, but mm -hmm. there was never the real majority, no. the two-third majority to, to take uh, a extra steps. Yeah. And the gray zone tends to be very big. Yeah. Um, it is when... It when does it start to hurt me personal mm -hmm. or my movement or my political party? Mm -hmm. Then I want to act. Only when the European elections were coming closer and Fidesz, uh, uh, the Hungarian uh, ruling party, yep. became um, a, a, a problem for, elec for political parties of the same family elsewhere in Europe. It's when, when they wanted to act. Yep. That in itself is populist already. Yep. Yeah, so even a reaction to populism in that sense is populistic. Yeah, a again here, I think the border parties, the parties that are not the new populist parties, but the parties that are afraid of them, yeah. say the you say is you, that fear them, those is that's where the danger comes from. Mm. And that's also where the change needs to come from. Mm. And and how do you explain this, this lack of, of reaction or resistance? Is it then really as simple as... On, only if it hurts me or my movement directly, that's when I act. Because, I mean, politicians also go into politics because they have a vision and a broader broader uh, a point on the horizon to work towards. So this this idea of, oh, well, as long as it's not affecting me, I'm, I take my hands off. How, how do you explain this, this passive reaction? This is my main question. <laughs> this goes for those that went into politics like Viktor Orban. Mm -hmm. He did go into politics with an idea and the peace party in Poland went into politics with an idea as well. Yeah. So if you have an idea about improving people's life, why do you then need to start uh, repressing uh, uh, media? I don't know. But here in this country, the, the, the national parliament, the, the, the lower chamber, now has a new in investigative committee that investigates a word that, that is new to me, dicastocracy. Dicastocracy is, uh, it, I'm saying this in dicastocracy. Well, keep that in mind. This is a, the idea that uh, judges rule the politics, and we had a couple of examples of very important court cases in the Netherlands that 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 made uh, politics in the Hague turn red, flush yeah. red. Urgenda, the uh, yes, uh, what yes. stick stuff in English? <laughs> Nitrogen, Nitrogen. Uh, smoking in, uh, in 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 bars and restaurants with a couple of issues. The fact that there is an agreement in the lower house to actually start investigating whether the, law, uh, the uh, judges are taking over is stepping right into the perfect extreme right, maybe populist narrative. That's I, I'm, I find the fact that we're investigated and the outcome will be very nuanced and we shouldn't be worrying probably, but the fact that we're debating it already it's is already a win. A, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Benjamin. Um, yes, you, of course you can, you can applaud. Wait, what do I do? It is on. You, uh, you should talk. 
Okay. should talk already. Just check, yes. Is it on? Okay. Is yeah. it on? It is on. Very good. Yeah, right, it is on or not? Yes, it is. Uh, okay, okay, so so um, so Benjamin, so you yes. are um, you research research more the the discourse, right? The narratives, the 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 the, the, the rhetoric um, of mm -hmm. populism, nationalism, conservatism. Yes. Um, if we if we because I want to also get back to what this uh, gentleman in in the audience said, like if we would look at uh, and which we also do in this series, if we look at democracy as something fluid, huh? something that, that can tr change, that can develop, that can um, uh, be in transition. Um, uh, but you also have the danger of democratic backsliding, of, of falling into this these steps that that uh, that really comes to the core of the democratic mm -hmm. system, sure. um, and then this this gray zone of how far can you push the limits? Uh, how when is the dem democratic st system still still intact, or is I it already about this damaged? gray zone? I'm not so sure if the zone is actually so gray. No, but the, the question is more. That Which a lot color of is it? <laughs> I think a lot of the steps taken in Hungary were not very great. It's mm -hmm. just that no one wanted to do anything. But why? Because, because this is her main question. Why did nobody it do anything? Because it didn't hurt them. I think I, I agree So very it's much as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I think the, responsibly of the, the responsibility of the German, social, uh, ger German Christian Democrats is immense. And there are parts of this story that I don't know well enough, but there are... I mean, there are stories about car factories and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't hear about. Mm -hmm that are much more real than anything about populism, I think, and, and are much more dangerous indeed. So I, I very much agree with that point. But anyway, to finish mm -hmm. your question, I just wanted to say mm -hmm. something about the gray zone. Yeah, of course. No, but if, I, because I'm, I, I would be interested to see if we can sort of make it a bit more visual. Like if we, if we um, look at this populistic rise and, mm -hmm. this, and this populistic attack mm -hmm. on our democracy, if we try to sort of uh, put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a process or on a spectrum and you mm -hmm. have the, the first uh, alarm bells in the beginning and then you have some cr really crucial steps that are being taken and then, well, somewhere over here, uh, uh, a broader coalition of, of parties is, is really feeling the, the heat. Um, wh what would be, if you now listen to, to these two cases of Poland of, and, and Hungary, what would be, in your perspective, this, this first uh, uh -huh. yeah, alarm signals? Okay. Maybe it's in the rhetoric as well, but... Uh I mean, there is something in the rhetoric, but I, I must say I was, I was very happy with, with uh, Judith Sargentini's intervention in that I agreed with your idea that the problem with Orban is not populism. Maybe Orban at some point was populist. I think at this mo moment in time, I'm not sure how much populist rhetoric is still left. And I think the real problem is kleptocracy, authoritarianism, democratic backsliding. And that strategically for Democrats in the world, speaking about Orban's populism or la labeling this issue populism is not the best choice in ma to my feeling. I think there are much more even if he was populist at some point in the sense of claiming to represent the people against the elite, mm -hmm. this is far less problematic than what he was actually been doing uh, also behind the scenes without much of that rhetoric and so on and so on. So I very much agree with you that th this is not the problem, yeah. I think. Um, okay, but these could also be steps on in the process eh, of, of... Yes, so I think that at some point there was an element of populist rhetoric to Orban. Mm -hmm. but there's there still, there is. still is. Yeah. He, he continues to he thrives to give with it now. As yeah, well, well uh, 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 he continues to talk about the Greater Hungary. He looks ab across the border to uh, Hungarian of minorities course. in the Ukraine, into Romania. Yeah. Yeah. He gives people the feeling that mistakes are being made elsewhere, and they have to suffer. So it's the populism is simple solutions for difficult. Um, yeah. but difficult issues. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, for example, the appealing to Hungarian history and the greatness of the Hungarian mm -hmm. nation, we have been victor victims forever, etc., mm -hmm. which is very Hungarian story. Yeah. Very strong narrative. Uh, uh, yes, I think, if I'm not mistaken, even the national anthem is like that. Mm. Um, this is, I think, has more to do with nationalism and appealing to the nationalist feelings. That's something it very much does, I think, much more than populism to some extent. Mm. But your question was about democratic backsliding and steps. Well, I, I, right? I, I just I'm trying to get a bit of a grip on this this uh, well this this timetable so, so yes, to speak of because it, it's wor I find it very worrying to hear that only after ten year ten years you have a bit of a broader movement that is really opposing a a, a development that is actually in its the, s the steps that were already taken 
maybe not even that gray. Uh, so some of them were not so gray. No, I think. So maybe some were gray, but some were definitely not. Just to see, like if if we would, uh, if we could find a, a grip or a handle on what kind of pointers we uh -huh. could take. Like, hey, this is the first alarm. This is the second okay. one. Okay, but we had those for yeah. Hungary or for yeah. Poland. For Hungary in 2010-10, when uh, Fidesz came into power with two-third majority, mm -hmm. the first thing they started to do is rewrite the constitution, and they did that in a couple of weeks' time and brought it through parliament in a couple of weeks. That's a pointer. Yeah. You don't change the constitution in a couple of weeks. And it, I'm not kidding you, but I had a colleague in the European Parliament that was bragging about how he rewrote the constitution on the weekly flights Budapest, Amster, uh, Budapest, Brussels, and back on his iPad. That's a pointer. Yeah. Uh, then Is they he called Tomasz? <laughs> then they... It's a very clear point. Uh, but he wasn't with my, my group. I know. <laughs> Then they, um, for instance, sacked the data protection officer, which you have to have, and replaced him for somebody who said the government can use data of people uh, quite more um, e lax. Mm -hmm. uh, then they came up with the proposal that media should, uh, uh, should report in a balanced way, not completely clarifying what balanced is, but if you were not balanced, you get huge fines and you, you had to close down your outlet. And balanced, imbalanced was, for instance, talking about gays and lesbians. That was clearly imbalanced. So there's pointers everywhere yes. all the time. Yeah. However, looked at looking at a country itself, it takes a while before a group of people starts to come together and decide this is going too far, we're protesting. Yeah. And when it comes to Europe, it, it shows that we have a lack of solidarity Absolutely. and all the other prime ministers thought uh, it's the com European Commission that is the uh, guardian of the treaties. They will act, I don't have to act because I don't want to ruin my relationships. Until so far that Theresa May, when she was uh, prime minister uh, and she had to get a Brexit deal going, she told her Tory colleagues in the European Parliament to not vote for my report on Hungary because the only friend she had left over in the Council of Ministers was Viktor Orban. So it's not only not being interested, hoping somebody else solves the problem, it's also continued to want to do business. Yeah. I think one, one thing that, that helps perhaps to, to understand Very what happens... Uh, uh, pragmatic is a nice <laughs> word to put it, maybe. Yes. Um, but I think, for example, there were big protests in Hungary. There were thousands of people on the streets on many occasions. And I think in, it took until the CEU story before Europe really noticed. Uh, but I, my, I, I, I'm married to a Hungarian woman. And uh, so, so I have... So it's I, not I a know sad thing in itself, right? It's not a sad thing in it. No, no, it's <laughs> no. not a sad thing in itself. But my, my, my father-in-law, who is a very smart man, he once told me that what, what, the way to look at this democratic backsliding is you have to think about the mechanism of a clock but it only moves in one direction, mm. right? <coughs> and what you can do through protests at some points is stop it from getting worse. So you can stop, but it doesn't turn backwards. And Orban is very good at this. So they try, they try, they try, uffa, this was a little bit too far, let's, let's take it a little bit slower. Or we might retract a little law here and there. And they, they, they seem to give in to protests a little bit sometimes, yeah. but it never goes back to the democracy it was before. And the things they have really gained, they keep them. And then they try something else. And if it doesn't work, they will try again a year later. And this yeah. is a feeling I had, at least, that this, this is a metaphor that, that, that captures it quite well, I think, because it also shows that the protest cannot do much more at this point mm -hmm. than making the democratic backsliding slow down. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Yeah. And that's the feeling. I, I, and I, I quite agree with that. I, it was a li nice metaphor, at, at the very least, yeah. I think. Barbara, because you also mentioned uh, this element of of, of protest uh, happening in in Poland, do you do you recognize with this? Uh, do you recognize yeah. this this metaphor? Do you agree with uh, the the well the inability to 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 push the clock back? Yeah, I mean definitely. Uh, during one of the demonstrations against, I guess one or another draft law, um, very famous um, uh, film director Agnieszka Holland, she made a statement which then was very criticized by the law and justice, and she said we want to make it be as it used to be before. So that was a kind of statement. We want what, what used to be. 
um, and that was even a part of the again smear campaign on the billboards organized by the by the by the government. The thing is, uh, and th that would refer to um, your questions about at what stage of uh, yeah. of history we are at the moment. I think we cannot get back to something which was undone before, meaning from my perspective, the rule of law was probably not fully implemented in Poland if it allowed to happen what happened, if the Constitutional Tribunal could be captured the way it was. But it's so not... The, the system was lacking in itself. On the level, I guess, on, a, on, on maybe on social belief that law actually rules. Maybe this was something which was missing. Because, and this answer is, is, is a different one to a question why law and justice won elections. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different story. Yeah. And the, the answer for that one would be much more mathematical, meaning the left wing was just divided and they lost the elections. But also the social transfers promised by the law and justice convinced much many people, much more people than, um, than any kind of other agenda. It was a pure corruption, but nevertheless in con in con just convinced um, people. And I think uh, the, there are a couple of analyses saying that what was wrong, what kind of lessons we haven't learned uh, before during this time of 30 years almost of transition, what was missing. And one of the, of one of the um, answer, I guess, from my perspective is just lack of accountability, of political accountability. Mm -hmm. And I already told that a couple of times that the, the major example why the accountability was not present in Poland was th the case of so-called CIA dark uh, sites detention in Poland. If this is the, the highest possible crime of international law that should be captured and charged and finally uh, resolved. If, if such case is not being uh, found accountable, mm. then you can you know, destroy any kind of institution because it's just allowed. Yeah. But okay, but, but um, I mean, it's not only Poland and, and Hungary where we see this populist uh, rise. Uh, does that then mean that there are cracks in the systems in, in all these different countries? Is, is that then explaining the, the possibility at least of populism to, to grow in that way? Is that, is that what you say? I think it depends on uh, two things, on legal culture and political culture. I mean, there are things, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been living in the Netherlands for one year, so I'm just trying to observe what is happening. I think there are a couple of things which cannot happen in the Netherlands because of the political culture. I'm not sure about legal one. Mm -hmm because there, there is no judicial review, for instance, in the Netherlands. So this is something which law and justice uses as argument. How can you criticize us if those Dutch don't have their own tribunal? Um, but on the political level, th there are things which cannot be pushed because, you know, because of the electoral system, because of the kind of discussions the, politics, uh, the politicians have that they cannot agree on something mm -hmm. because it's just in unimaginable in, in, in the system. So. What we are doing, uh, actually, in the University of Groningen, we are trying to look for, for, for instance, for good practices of the rule of law. And it can be a little bit challenging because you have to really look into a system as a whole and look really what made you know, the Dutch system a good, pra uh, a good practice and w in what respect. So I guess history and culture might be really strong um, factors to, mm -hmm. to say why um, why Netherlands so far can be protected against populism and why Poland was not yeah, in 2015. But, but again, it depends what you mean by protected against populism. Yeah. If it means protected against democratic backsliding, fundamental democratic backsliding, yes, protected against populism and the impact of populist parties in the Netherlands is quite very strong. Yeah. What you said, I think mm -hmm. in terms of the center moving to the right in certain ways, the debate about being about Islam for the last 20 years, yeah. Um, the role of Pim Fortuyn in that, and so on and so on, is Until now was, the rise of, uh, was very strong, I think. Yeah. So, in that sense, I, I, I would, I mean, if if, the if we are talking about democratic backsliding and how mm -hmm. to stop that, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, the influence of populism does not arise only when populists, typically, we're talking here about populist radical right parties enter power. The Vlaams Belang in in Flanders mm -hmm. has had an immense impact on 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 Belgian politics for the last, what, 30 years, without ever having any governmental uh, responsibility. But their impact on, on the debate and on, on, on policies has been very, very strong. Mm -hmm. But this is something else than, let's say, the, the rule of law and democratic yeah. backslide. But if, yeah. it's, if we're talking about the rights of refugees, the debate about Islam, and so on and so on, yeah. we are having discussions now that were unthinkable and that would have been unthinkable without them. Yeah. So that's they were a, a disgrace. Uh, or or, or yeah. let's talk about 
there was another demonstration of farmers today in The Hague. Mm -hmm. Fine for them. They're completely entitled to it. But they're demonstrating against a policy of a government that has been lax. I mean, we're creating our own mistrust. The fact that these farmers are angry because they have to change business models drastically from one day to another yeah. is because they were promised something a couple of years ago that was not possible. Yeah. Still, we did it. So here, the border parties are giving way for extreme uh, voices, yeah. whether it's farmers' defense form, for, uh, uh, form or yeah. farmers' defense force, like, there you go, <laughs> or Forum for Democracy or yeah. PVV, yeah. it is mis, it is wrong politics of the so-called elite, of those in power, yeah. that actually gives space for this right now. Yeah. So we should focus on the establishment uh, instead of the, the populist yes. uh, movement. Yes. <laughs> I saw a hand. Please remind me where you are. Yes. If you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Noah. I'm a student at the VU. Uh, and this actually fits nicely with what Judith was, was saying now, because my question is, since the theme of the evening is sort of populism possibly as a friend for democracy, um, the distinction between a popular movement and a populist movement. Um, and so whether, so if we ask, if, if we talk about popu populist movements in itself as possibly being a friend rather than sort of the reaction to it, if we take, for example, a popular movement, which I assume you would say about protesting for climate uh, for climate friendly policies and stuff like that, which ties into sort of what you were saying about pro protesting and against an establishment policy. Um, if we say, for example, that uh, civil disobedience and uh, Fridays for Future, which maybe at this point is a popular movement, not a populist movement, goes as far as saying, for example, the way the establishment works right now and the democratic institutions we have. Suppose they're just not apt to deal with sort of a supranational challenge such as environmental and climate change. If sort of Fridays for Future, for example, pushes it so far that you would classify it as a populist movement, would that be a bad thing or could it also be a positive thing because it wouldn't fit sort of the populist right things we've been talking about so far? Uh, this is actually what we're going to go into in the, during the second panel as well, but maybe one of the panelists would like well, to react, as a s but then should I do it as a, like a sweet yeah. starter. Not it's a very, it's a very, it's very nice question. I, I have a course on populism, and this is one of the questions. The question is basically, imagine that you are the advisor of a Green Party, and your advice to the Green Party would be, please become more populist. What would you do? This is what we're constantly struggling with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The answers of my students so, so far have not been of the level that I would be able to advise you. But so I think what, what the climate change protests don't have so much, in, uh, implicitly, yes, but not explicitly, they are not so anti-elite or anti-establishment as they potentially could be, I think. It wouldn't be very difficult to turn them into an anti-establishment movement, saying that there is a collusion between economic powers and political powers that they destroy the planet and that it's ordinary people suffering from this and so on and so on. This is the right answer to the exam question, <laughs> uh, by the way. <laughs> but so This is on live stream, eh? your students can see this later. Oh yes, it's yes. true, I didn't think about that. <laughs> well, there goes my question. <laughs> but, all right. but if they've watched this, they also deserve the point, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but so that would be my answer. So I don't think they do that so much. I think the potential is there. But of course, they, do, they, 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 they approach this differently and they build much more on expert knowledge, climate science, and so on and so on, which gives a very different feel to an extent to that movement, I think. Um, and they don't have this anti-establishment appeal so much. Th it, there are elements of it, but it could be much stronger. I'm not saying they should do it, but that would be, then it would be a true populist movement, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and you did hear, you're saying this is our struggle. Should we become more more populist in in our ways or or not? Is this is this really something that? Well, uh, Ben, you said that political parties not, are not only there to represent their own voters; they want to reach out to the population at large. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Yeah. And how do you do that by stay but continue to stand for your topics? Are we dropping our emancipatory anti-discrimination policies and only focus on social economic issues? Because that would widen the scope of people that could vote for us. Or are we not? This is a constant debate. Yeah. And this is actually a constant debate in every political party. How much of 
how uh, how yeah uh, and it depends on how far you want to go there uh, and and i'm happy that we still haven't gone the way that for instance premier rutte said if you don't like it here then just leave yeah or his letter in the newspaper to all Dutch citizens of a certain <laughs> particular color. Yeah. Things like that, I think you're moving away from 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 the from your your the basis that you should protect. Yeah. And, and that your ideals also. Your, your ideals base, your, your and you're moving away you're moving away from a pluralistic society. And therefore mm -hmm. the definition on uh, populism as anti pluralistic that I get. Yeah. That is where the danger lies. Yeah. Another question from here. What I do miss in the discussion so far is the role of the media, especially right-wing media, who spread fake news, biased news, like the Murdoch papers or Murdoch-owned Fox propaganda. Oh, sorry, Fox News. Um, these are really fundamental. I mean, Brexit is the result of a drip feed of 30 years of EU hatred in the tabloids, coupled with some really nice campaign by, aided by Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the forces for good uh, uh, representative democracy have just been caught off guard by the new, uh, by the new uh, possibilities of social media. Yeah. That's how Trump won in America. But, yes, but yeah. You see, as a politician, I think it is, or as a former politician, as currently simple unemployed citizen, um, <laughs> happily <laughs> unemployed <laughs> citizen, uh, I think this is not where I am supposed to talk. I mean, Brexit came because um, because um, um, uh, the then Prime Minister of, uh, of, of, of the UK thought, we solved this once and for all because we're going to throw in this referendum, I'm going to fail, and then for the next 20 years we don't have to talk about it. It's irresponsible politics that made Brexit happen. Yes, backed up by all sorts of media. And the same goes for Trump. It's irresponsible politics that made him happen. And of course it was supported by media. But I would have a journalist here reflecting on their own role rather than... Pointing fingers in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I actually yeah. saw a couple of days before um, a comment from one of the Polish journalists who after years of discussion about populism and uh, the role of media in this um, whole situation, he actually admitted, yes, it's our fault. Yes, journalists' fault. Mm. Um, might also be a simplistic answer to a complicated situation. Right. Of course it might yeah. be. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's much more, not only the society is divided, not only politics is divided, also media are divided. And uh, sometimes I have the feeling that they just, d they become a prolongation of the public statements made in media and by, by journalists, which make additional kind of um, legitimacy of such statements. Mm -hmm. It's not a control anymore, it's, it's a sort of, um, public debate, just put in, in, in media, but this is a kind of extreme. I, I think one of the of the, of the chance um, is to sort of relearn the, the 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 lesson about uh, the, the journalist ethics. However, I'm not journalist and I'm not um, specialist in this in this topic, so I, I guess um, it has to it, it will have to start with from from, from the media I inside. It, I don't think it might be just imposed by some um, fr from the outside. I think if, yeah. I, if I can just say one thing, as, as much as I think we should talk about populism less in certain ways, I, I think, for example, <laughs> that, that journalists in dealing with someone like Trump are in an impossible situation. Either you criticize him and then he criticizes you for being the elite, enemy of the people, fake media, yeah. and so on and so on. There is no escaping someone like that. It's like a catch the fact that do not hurt him if you criticize him, he will destroy you as being part of the elite. If you don't criticize him, that's also good. So in a sense, I mean, I, there's all kinds of things you can say about journalism and everything can be better and so on and so on, absolutely. But I think that, that it's also very difficult for them to deal with some, some phenomenon like that. I mean, they did criticize Trump very much. Mm -hmm. The way American media, I mean, many American media, not all of them, obviously, but many American media have criticized Trump is something that we had not seen before. 
the extent to which they started fact-checking, he told so many lies today, et cetera, et cetera, it just doesn't help. So I'm not sure, I mean, I'm sure there is all kinds of criticisms you can formulate, but I'm not sure wh what they, in a case like this, could actually do. But if you want a pointer, Johnson propo is probably proposing to change the BBC structures. Exactly. From yeah. paying your annual fee for public broadcasting to becoming a subscriber to the broadcasting. Yeah. So if you want flag. a point, exactly. The, the Flemish alarm government flag. is cutting again the, the financing of the public broadcaster. Yeah. Uh, which, and they are threatening them, basically. Yeah. And so... And through that, the role of, of independent journalism as a Or at least of, of, of journalism that is funded in such a way that yeah. it doesn't depend on yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So there, yeah. there is, I mean, there is a, a yeah. long-standing right-wing attack on public service media, of course, which is not a new thing, yeah. but, yeah. Okay, thank you. We're, we have to round up this uh, this first part of the, of the evening. Um, thank you very much. I think that the, the clearest alarm flag that I received from this is that we now organize this evening on, um, uh, well, uh, zooming in on, on the populace, but maybe we should actually zoom in on the, the well, at least the non-self-proclaimed populist, <laughs> um, well, other political parties that are lack lacking and that are making the system also uh, develop in that direction. Uh, so that's, thank you for that. Um, give them a, a warm uh, thank you. Thank them. Yes. Because um, we're now we're now going to move to the other part, which might be a little bit difficult now that we've heard all this uh, disturbing news on on the the role of populism for our uh, democracy. Uh, but we're going to try and reopen our minds again and uh, uh, approach the the issue from a different perspective. Um, and uh, doing so, I'm going to invite. Um, uh, Paul Blocker to the to the to the table um, to also share his personal and professional experience um, uh, as an associate professor in political sociology at the Department of Sociology and Business Law, University of Bologna, and it's not done, and is research coordinator at the Institute of Sociological Studies, Charles University, Prague. It's a really a full, uh, full sentence to say. I'm very curious uh, to hear about uh, your statement. Um, I will give you a mic. And then we will get back to the table after. OK. Yes. Um, yeah, well, this is a bit of a, a tough <laughs> job, I have to say, cleaning up the mess <laughs> <laughs> that has been left Good on luck. the table. Um, <laughs> but I will do. <laughs> uh, well, in the sense that, I mean, we have heard a lot of different things about populism. Um, and I think it's clear that uh, there's no consensus on what it actually refers to. And that, that directly ties into uh, what I'm going to sort of uh, um, share with you. That is, um, I'm still formally a Dutch citizen, but I've been living in Italy for 20 years now. And as many um, observers and particularly astute Italian observers have argued, Italy is one of the first pioneering countries in terms of populism. And it also means it's a country that has experienced very different manifestations of populism. Um, and that makes, uh, uh, talking about that makes my job particularly different, I think, because I can't really start with a very optimistic story about, yeah, well, populism <laughs> is going to solve the whole thing. Uh, that just doesn't work. Um, but this, this approach of, of looking at, at Italy as a laboratory of populisms, I think that might bring us into a direction, push us into a direction that helps try to understand when populism does uh, uh, bring up some kind of form of democratic innovation and when it doesn't. And I think the Italian case has lots of both, more of the dark side than of the, uh, uh, the bright side, but yeah, we'll, we'll see where we, uh, where we wind up. Um, so, well, I only got um, to live in Italy from the end of the 1990s, actually 1999, and clearly populism emerged much earlier. And so I think one thing to stress is that indeed populism is a reaction to something. 
it's a reaction to a system that doesn't work. Uh, I think that in most cases that, that, that is clear. Uh, and so when I arrived in Italy uh, in 99, the system had already, because of that, also changed. And so you have a malfunctioning, malfunctioning democratic system. In Italy, it was clearly a widespread corruption crisis, tangentopoli, uh, which basically blew away the whole existing party system. And so populism emerged on the scene as a solution, as a way of retying, re-relating the citizens to the institutions. Well, when I arrived, it was clear it had not done the job. Uh, and wh one of the things that has uh, uh, always been a puzzle to me, and I think it, it, it completely dovetails with many of the other stories, even cases like Hungary and Poland, which are in a way in a much dire state, is that um, populism in many of its manifestations leads to polarization. And that's something to think about, about because in Italy in particular, it moved the system dramatically away from some kind of idea of a consensus-based system towards a, a divided majoritarian system. Um, and so that meant, for instance, when, when, when I just arrived in Italy, that first of all, Berlusconi was the the main topic in politics, from the populist side and from the anti-populist side, but it also meant that you couldn't really have a pluralistic debate anymore for all kinds of reasons. Um, but but and, and so the, the, the solution that populism was going to provide, and that Berlusconi himself, but also the Lega Nord at the time, uh, uh, promoted was uh, bringing the the, the people, as Ben uh, argued, back into the system again, uh, that has uh, dramatically uh, uh, backfired in a way. And that the, the importance is, I think, of the Italian case is that different parts of the system, different parties within the system, they have been reproducing a view of democracy that has been hollowing out uh, Italian democracy ever since. Uh, and so, the, the, the pro-Berlusconi and the anti-Berlusconi of the 1990s and the 2000s in particular was then later, after a moment of confusion when Berlusconi uh, uh, basically was ousted out of power in the end of 2011, and then uh, between that and the, the, the general elections in 2013, and after that, it became a new type of uh, uh, polarization, which is now particularly the Salvinians and the anti-Salvinians. Um, so that's a very important aspect, I think, of the Italian case, uh, where indeed any kind of pluralistic discussion about democratic institutions, about what to do, about uh, massive clientelism, corruption, etc., uh, that is almost impossible. Uh, Le Sardine, and that were mentioned before, and I'm very proud of them because I, I've been only working at the University of Bologna for a year now, but they're in a way my students too. And, and luckily Bo Bologna in a way is, uh, and by the way, between parentheses, I had never applied for Italian citizenship, so I probably can forget about it right now by saying all this kind of stuff. But uh, anyhow, the, the Sardine, they on the one hand, they clearly show democratic potential, but on the other hand, of course, they feed into this polarization story too. They were, and they still are, a platform of anti-Salviniism. Uh, is that uh, the way to go? That's, that's a question to be asked, of course. Um, and so one of the, the, the key issues then, I think, is this polarization, which indeed destroys pluralism and destroys, I think, something very dear, particularly to the Dutch, the idea of a consensus-based democracy. That, I mean, what was said before about the voice of the people is essential, I think. The people is never one. I don't even feel really Dutch while I've been away for a long time. Rutte, uh, he didn't even need to kick me out. I mean, I was already gone. Uh, but of course, there is one voice of the people. But this uh, drive to polarization uh, uh, turns it in a way, into two voices, which I find very disturbing. You see it in the US, you see it in Hungary, you see it in Poland, you see it in Italy, maybe you see even see it in the Netherlands, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be sure about that. Um, but so to bring it in a, in a way closer to home, 
the polarization drive in Italy has gone as uh, gotten as far as the not the current government but the prior government the yellow green government the Lega five star movement government uh, where this really really became uh, so dramatic that well I joined with other intellectuals like a, a famous uh, uh, political uh, uh, theorist Nadia Urbinati uh, in a group of intellectuals trying to contrast this um, because the government in place uh, started moving dangerously, in my view, and uh, according to many, towards a kind of Polish-Hungarian scenario. And it's not by coincidence, of course, that Salvini nicely closes up with uh, Orban and, and, and Kaczynski, etc. Um, and so, well, um, how to move from this then? I, I promised to start out with a story that perhaps looked a bit dark uh, and, and might remain a bit dark, but there were bright sides as well. well I think there are bright sides, but you have to look for them very carefully, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, and the key question then is, how is populism potentially a force that reinvigorates democracy? Um, I think there are at least three aspects. Um, the first one is questioning the status quo. I think that's essential. And I might come back to that later, but if, if time allows me, but if you look, for instance, at the European Union, the status quo has to be questioned because the thing is coming down uh, rapidly. Um, so that's an important part, a critical force, a critical function, an anti-establishment, an anti-embedded uh, political and capital, uh, capitalist forces that basically uh, uh, divide the cake amongst them. A second aspect is to include those people that have never really been part of the system before. And so an inclusionary uh, approach towards citizens, and I think that's in a way what Ben is trying to say, that, that, that in a very classical sort of Roman Republican sense uh, would refer to the people not as a nation, not as a homogeneous unit per se, but as the plebs, as the, as the, as the non-franchised, as the non-represented, as the victimized, as the marginalized. Um, but of course, if populism only does that, it doesn't really steer the system more structurally in a different direction. So you need policy, reform, maybe even more. Um, I won't say too much about one aspect that I'm working on this, because maybe it's just too complex and boring, but part of that is constituent power, meaning changing the rules of the game. Uh, that is an essential part of populism too. Why do so many of these populists toy around with constitutions, constitutional norms, constitutional amendments? In Poland, they don't have the right numbers to actually formally change the constitution. So what they, do they do? They just do it in their own illegal, inconstitutional way. But it's a very important part. And one part of the world we, we haven't mentioned, which is utterly outrageous, I think, but it's called Latin America. And that's where populism, in a way, was invented. I mean, it can get more populist than that, in a way. Uh, uh, and maybe we should draw that into the uh, uh, discussion. But anyhow, uh, coming back to the Italian case, so Italy is a very complex case. Uh, we have the Berlusconi and telepopulism. We have the Lega sort of secessionist populism, which is now just plain old radical right sovereignism. Uh, but we also have this strange beast called the Five Star Movement that's still there. Uh, and from a personal experience, I came into contact with a number of people from the Five Star Movement because I had been working on constitutional reform and civic participation as one very peculiar, but I think very important way of reforming the system. And when did this pop up in particular after the 2007 financial and economic crisis, think of cases like Iceland, Ireland, economies collapsing, huge crisis, response, constitutional reform. Well, the Five Star Movement was extremely interested in that. And so uh, one of the important figures still in that movement, Ricardo uh, Fracaro, interviewed me in a tiny office in, in Trento 
uh, where he was part of the, the, the local movement, the Five Star Movement. I was still working in the university there at the time. And then later, or, or actually uh, more or less the same time, I, I interviewed him as well in Montecitorio, which is the lower house of the Italian parliament in Rome. Um, but uh, I, I draw this into the, the discussion because he's one of the main figures in the Five Star Movement had, who has consistently promoted citizen participation into democracy, um, reform of the Italian constitutional system so as to allow for a more pluralistic, strengthened way of civic voice into the system. Um, this has actually made it into the last government, um, so the first Conte government, as they call it, 2018-2019, and, and one of the constitutional revisions or amendments still hoovering there somewhere in the institution is about radically strengthening citizens' legislatives, legislative initiatives and lowering dramatically the quorum for the abrogative referendum. So that's Article 71 and 75 of the Italian Constitution. So to show off that I also know a little bit about law there. Um, but why is this important? Because the Five Star Movement is clearly a typical or an atypical, I should say, populist movement. I mean, it came up with its so-called vafanculo days, which literally means fuck off days. Um, so literally representing the plebs, the marginalized, the normal people, the ordinary people who actually made it into the institutions. Um, so in that sense, I feel there is, in this multiple, this variegated landscape of populists, some of them do indeed engage with strengthening actual civic participation. The Orbans, the Kaczynskis, they never do that. But the Chavez, uh, the Koreas in Latin America did. So th I don't have any answers there. Uh, I don't have any final conclusions, but it's, 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 it's an important question to ask. Um, how does this work? Why do some populist movements make a strong point out of direct participatory uh, forms of democracy and others don't? Um, another part of it, uh, very briefly, and I still want, I want to make a bit of a, um, a publicity for Le Sardine because I think they're very important. Uh, another dimension, of course, of the Italian story is the surprising resistance, uh, the bottom-up, uh, reaction against attempts to institutionalize populism. I've been uh, quite structurally uh, researching various attempts at constitutional reform in Italy. I found that the Berlusconi reform of 2005-2006 was strangely familiar to the Renzi reforms of 2014-2016. But why didn't these work? Well, one of the key reasons was civil society stood up. So if we talk about populism, we have to talk about anti-populism. Uh, and we have to talk about, I'm going to use a bit of a difficult term again, uh, forms of constitutional resistance. And that's again, I think in Poland, a very interesting part of the story too that we maybe perhaps in a certain way might um, talk about further. I think I'll leave, leave it to that because yes. it's more than enough already. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so in, I think in this sense, the, the, the thing that I will take from this talk to this table is that uh, while populism might be the result of a system that is malfunctioning in a way, if injected in the right, in the specific and the correct way in a, in a, in a specific culture and, and, and legal system, it could also maybe be a solution to help this system function better. This is sort of the provocation that I got from your talk, but we're gonna we're gonna uh, have a okay. seat. Um, I want to respond. Now. Yes, but you can res you can respond, but we're gonna respond here because that we also cannot uh, make the clock go back. So no, we have to we have to <laughs> improvise a bit. Um, to so uh, together with <laughs> Paul, um, I <laughs> exactly I would like to in invite uh, Lucia Barcena, uh, researcher at the Transnational Institute, to also please join us at the table. Give her a warm welcome, everyone. Um,
and I would also like to invite Nisko Dubbelboer, a, a coordinator of Mere Democracy, More Democracy, um, and uh, the director of Agora uh, Europe, uh, to also join us. Nisko, welcome. Does everyone still have a glass? Do you have one? So, uh, Paul, but to, to give you the possibility to, to just briefly uh, respond um, uh, to this, because this is, the, this is sort of the provocation that, that stuck with me. Uh, what if we look at populism as a way to maybe repair or develop our... Oh, Niska, are you really doing this? Twitter, eh? Uh oh. Uh, to repair or correct or um, improve our... Our, our democratic system, our, our maybe not fully functioning democratic system <coughs> uh, in, a, in a different direction. Is that, is that indeed the, the provocation you want to put on the table? Well, m maybe, maybe I do, but <laughs> the thing is, uh, I mean... It, it, it's the, okay. The, 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 it problem with, the problem with populism is uh, y you can discuss it in a very short period of time. Because, mm. I mean, if you want to seriously discuss the influence of populism on democratic systems, you should at least go to the back to the late 19th century or in the US or so, or to another European cases, mm -hmm. uh, or seriously discuss the Latin American cases from the early 1990s onwards. Yeah. And so it's it's very difficult to say yes and no, yeah. or, or no. I okay. mean, but that's like going to be very difficult in the in the conversation, right? So we're exactly let's accept okay, the so fact so let's that be we're in a pressure let's, cooker. Let's be provocative. I yes. think populism is a problem. I think populism is a problem in a very essential sense that maybe that it, it, it sort of reverberates with what was said before. Mm -hmm. um, if the people comes into play, there will be a stage in which. Um, the leader, because a pop populism doesn't exist without a leader, I think. Mm -hmm. So the leader will say, I impersonate uh, the, the leader, uh, and these are the people. And those are not the people, they are enemies. Yeah. Yeah. And you so see then you that have the inclusion and the exclusion. And so the, but the, the, the key but example is Chavez mm -hmm. in Venezuela. Yeah, but uh, wait, wait. Chavez, yes. But uh, we're, we're, we're now going to, because this was the previous panel. So we need, yeah, to, we need to challenge okay. ourselves <laughs> to let go of the previous panel. Right, and 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 let's see if we can get to this idea of this provocation of how maybe populism or the result of populism yeah. could help towards reviving the democratic uh, system that we that we uh, want to cherish. Um, and one of the things you said was um, uh, so this this questioning of the establishment and this including and activating of the people uh, that. You do that by changing the rules. And then I ha actually have to think of you, Nisko, because oh. you also like to change the rules. To be a rule maker. Yeah. A rule maker, yeah. but um, uh, I, I think you did, well, connect with a lot of the things that mm -hmm. Paul just mentioned. So can you maybe just, for the audience, explain a little bit about uh, what you're working towards with Mere Democratie and Agora Europe? Um, th th that could also be a very long story, mm -hmm. starting in 1990. No, 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 we're, pressure we're going cooker. back here now. Um, I try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, th I'm, I'm a big advocate of direct democracy. Um, with being a big advocate of direct democracy, I'm very often placed in the camp, in the, in the section of populist, because I am anti-establishment. At the same time, I've been totally part of the establishment. I've been a member of parliament, mm -hmm. but in the mem as a member of parliament, I brought forth the referendum law, um, which was uh, abolished just uh, a year ago, more than a year ago. And with my movement, More Democracy, we fought against it in a very populist way. I couldn't be enough populist, so to speak, <laughs> as could also not as the other part also came with horrible populist arguments against the referendum anyway. Um, but uh, I think the essential thing is that um, in, 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 in both ways, the moment populists become, uh, get into power, mm -hmm. uh, they become dangerous. Because? And because they, they, very often, they want to extend their powers. Mm -hmm. And the moment people get in power and want to extend their powers, enlarge their powers, um, yeah, that's very tricky. 
Um, so you have to be, um, uh, how do you say that? But you have to come up with rules. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with, with uh, um, a constitutional rules that take care of a pluralistic uh, society. Mm -hmm. But it can only be done, and that's the point I want to bring to the table, in the more democratic, more direct democratic a society is, and a constitution is, the better the, um, the guarantees for there, uh, are there for. So uh, to, to, to put Why? it, well, to put it on the table, if, if um, to give an example, Geert Wilders can be very easily a populist in the parliament. He can shout that all the Muslims have to be banned from everything. If we would have uh, the possibility of lots of referenda, then he would never come up with that proposal because he knows there will be no support. I believe in the wisdom of the people. I believe, I'm a true believer of, of Mr. Rutger Brechman, who just wrote a beautiful book about most people are okay. Most people do not want to be extreme or find uh, extreme solutions. They only come up with voting for populists mm -hmm. because they see it as the only solution to not being hurt. And the moment that in the rule of law and in the constitution it's arranged that people can be heard more often and on their account, and not only if the power that is in charge at that moment wants a referendum, like what Cameron did with the Brexit, completely wrong way of referendum, then you have your solution to, to, to deal with populism. That's my okay. point. But so you are saying uh, I used populist mm -hmm measures, I, you, I, I created a populist movement, <coughs> I'm anti-establishment, are you a populist? Oh yeah, at this moment I think I'm a populist. Yeah? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, you know, I am a, a Labour Party person and I'm the only Labour Party person that has always been Labour praised, Party populist been praised by this right-wing website, Geen Stel. Yeah. They're my biggest friends, you know. They, <laughs> they, they always said he's a pay van hour, a former Labour guy, mm -hmm. but he is, he is good, you know, yeah. he's, he's the good one. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, I d sure. That's why I say it with a <laughs> grin on my face. You can't see it, of course. <laughs> um, but it is true that if... Um, um, yeah, I, I, I think I consider myself at this moment being a populist, but it's also a little bit what, what you did uh, said, that every political party is always looking and, you know, how, how to make a narrative uh, that, um, that gathers the most votes uh, on, on, on your side. And then, you, of course, you come up with populist things. Every party does that. So... But that, by saying it that, I, I want to come back to the definition. I'm definitely not a populist if the definition is being an anti-pluralistic person or party that wants to, once in power, exclude other people from being able to get in the power as well. So I think that's the biggest distinction. Yeah. But in the broad sense of what Ben had said in the beginning, the engagement, Anti -establishment, and, yeah. the, 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 the engagement and changing the system, and there's a big need to change the system. Yeah. Yes, then I'm a populist. Yeah. And Lucia, because um, Spain is, is, is in, in that sense, I think, uh, but that's an assumption, maybe Nisco will, will uh, correct me, but I think it, many cities in Spain uh, are in that sense an inspiration if you, if you look at the way of engagement of, of, of the public, uh, gain, uh, activation of create, creation of a movement uh, with Podemos, but also even uh, with Ada Colau really en entering the, the system uh, in that sense, uh, from, from the activist role into the... Uh, into the, the and, and stick to her promises. And stick to her promises. Um, um, just also, if you could... Um, uh, if you would have to relate yeah. the work that you are doing and that you had have done before to, to to this idea of populism as this engagement of, of the community, this engagement of, of, of civil society, would you also identify yourself as a as a populist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I have never even thought of identifying myself into this. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, thanks for inviting me and thanks for also having in the table the cases of uh, in Spain and in the Southern Europe, and of course very linked to Latin America, as you were saying. And also I think the time is very late, like even for us in Spain, it's incredibly late, no? So uh, thanks for everybody to, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's approaching our dinner time. So thanks for everybody, you know, for being here and, and still awake. Um, I don't know, I think the case of Spain is like Podemos and all the 59 movement has created a lot of like fantasies as well, you know? like. 
every time we go out of Spain and we, to speak about this, everybody like, yeah, like idealizes a lot what has happened in Spain and in terms of like how the movement created a party and now they're actually in the government. And it's true that uh, within Spain, we haven't even solved some of the questions and there are so many thin lines to draw from what has Podemos actually done. Is it a populist movement? Uh, is it looking for a real like breaking the hegemo hegemony? Like, you know, like hegemony? the yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the economy, or is it only going to remain in the discursive kind of arena, right? Okay. So, and yes, it's true that Podemos might be one of the few examples in Europe to that you can connect a populism to the left, right? So, and and that has been successful, mm -hmm. and and yeah, and it was of course very much influenced by Venezuela, Bolivia. That's not a secret. Our main leader of Podemos has a lot of uh, links to, to Venezuela and Bolivia, and this has been their strategy since the beginning. So, but using populism as a mean to obtain something uh, at the end, right? Well, in this sense, to, to fix something in the system, that's actually the provocation. Well, either to fix down, no? or to actually achieve to, to, you know, to communicate in a different way. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that has not been done in the past for, from the left, from the classic traditional left in Spain that has always very much focused into explaining the programmatic, uh, you know, their programs, the facts, what they wanted to explain. But now with Pod the eruption of Podemos, what they did really try and what was innovative was the fact that they tried to communicate more the emotions and, you know, to attach on the, yeah, it was important to connect with passion, emotions, and stay with the principles, but let's communicate in a different way. Actually, it's interesting to see that there's not really like, you know, like the program and the, uh, you can read it, but it's not like the main thing that they have, you know? What they have developed much more, it's all this communication strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's seen as a populist way of achieving power and not only institutional power, but also like media and in society. Mm -hmm. That has been successful, you can say that. Um, I'm, yeah, also, I mean, also true that now, we must see. I mean, it's kind of early to, to see it, say if Podemos was a success or it wasn't a success. Um, but, do, but do you think, because there, there's several layers to it, right? So um, civic participation has increased. It has, has been beneficiary to um, uh, the amount of civic participa participation in, in Spain. Yeah. I think we, we can all agree on that. Um, but uh, has it really, do you think the that the democratic system itself has in some forms been strengthened or, or, or has there been an innovation within that system uh, by this, this movement uh, such as Podemos? Is, is that something that you already dare to draw a conclusion about? Or So maybe what I wanted to raise is that, um, of course, like Podemos comes from all these mm -hmm. uh, 15M movements in a very particular moment in Spain where there was a crisis. And it was a crisis that was expelling a lot of sectors from the economy. So, so, so yes, uh, Podemos managed to capitalize that anger into a party. And, but after that, that's when the confusion starts somehow. Because, you know, like after that, uh, we might feel like the strategy of Podemos was to win the state, was to take over the state. But that did not necessarily uh, mean anymore that they wanted to build a social movement or a, or a structure behind. So I, that's what I wanted to bring, you know? Like, if it's the strategy to win over the state, is it enough? Um, yeah, if, if your main strategy is remaining in the dis discourse, like, how can we, yeah, how can we mean the, how can we win the discursive hegemony of our ideas? Is it enough if we, it only remains there? and it doesn't move towards other life, you know, like other areas of life. Um, yeah, because if that's, you know, like at the end, if it only remains there, that means that we're not gonna be able to really challenge the economy, which is really where we want to have the hegemony, right? So, so at the moment, yes, we do see some popular um, proposals that come from the social movements, but not necessarily the ones that are going to really change the, the system or the, or, the, or the establishment. That's why it's so important that, that we need resistance, we need demonstrations, we need strikes. Like one thing does not um, deactivate the other yeah. one. And actually yeah. without one, probably the other one is not going to react to, to the proposals that society is actually having. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, if we look at, um, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the fact that, that Podemos has really been 
entered the system in that sense, um, then you could question if you are anti-establishment, how can you be anti-establishment if you're if you're it, right? Well. Um, yes. I think in Madrid it's very interesting. Uh, although after the elections, the, the party of Adekolau did not win, but I think she's still the mayor because there's a kind of coalition shape now. Um, well, one of the very impressive things that she did, and that's what I meant when I said she kept a promise, mm -hmm. is that she put in Madrid office uh, 40 people who were working on Consul. And Consul is a highly digitalized online environment for uh, uh, neighborhood budgeting, yeah. uh, for participatory planning, for, uh, for referenda. And um, her strategy was to say, we don't want to um, to do it too, too careful or step by step. No, we have to do it at once and we have to do it at once right, in the right way. Because then the next time when we lose the elections, that structure will be there and then the power will be more in hands of the citizens. So that's the systemic and innovation that you need. With that kind of populism, I love that kind of populism. But it's very dangerous when an Orban or anybody else who says that they are the voice of the people mm -hmm. get in power and then break down all the instruments and all the canals yeah. for the people yeah. to get uh, uh, to the power. Yeah. And th then Nisko, so if you, um, uh, because one of the, the main issues that already was raised right at the beginning, right, by yeah. who is actually <coughs> the people and who is the voice of the people and how diverse is that, um, if, you, if you could work with those direct democracy mechanisms, if you could implement that more within the system to engage and activate the people uh, and, and work towards such a, a change in also the, the way that the system uh, is uh, constructed. Um, how can you make sure uh, that, you, that you do that in an inclusive way? Because one of the, the issues that you mentioned as well is that we go from the consensus from the, the yeah. yeah, so, towards the division and the polarization. So how uh, uh, do you have maybe have an example in which you see that it's also possible to do that in a, in a way that might maybe come closer to really representing the people uh, yes, as far uh, as that's possible? Very, very often, uh, I, I'd like to point to Switzerland, and uh, you living close to Switzerland uh, <laughs> uh, maybe knows that better than I do, but um, the visits I brought there, what I see, what, what's going on with the referenda, there's a whole, and, and people always tell me, yeah, but Nisko, that's, that's Switzerland, that's, uh, that's a culture. And Something they have that culture for a thousand years yeah. and that's impossible to install here. It's like, well, hey, they started somewhere, you know, they started one, let's start let's here too. Let's build a culture. Oh, yeah, and, and on local level, we do already have more of a referendum culture. In Amsterdam, we have now about uh, eight or nine referenda over the last 20, 25 years. So there is a kind of, uh, um, you know, you, it, it has to grow, it has to develop. Um, and yes, it is very logical in, and to say that a referendum is, is a polarizing instrument because you have yes and no. Um, at the same time, when <laughs> you look in Switzerland, when you look in Switzerland, then people are pr doing proposals, initiatives, taking initiatives from the people themselves, not from the power, but from the people themselves. And if they lose, then they think, oh, well, okay, we lost, but next year we will try it again. And the interesting thing is that um, uh, it, it diversifies. So you never belong to one specific group or to one specific party. You belong, you, you, you are part, sometimes you're part of the winners and sometimes you're part of the losers in a referendum. And that has a kind of a interesting calming effect, I would almost say, on, on this polarization thing. So yes, it, they can have their debates. Um, uh, but I've, you know, I've even been to um, uh, uh, a place where they had with 4,000 people a meeting in, in, uh, in Appenzell. Um, I was struck. They have that every year, the last Sunday in April. And they come together and they have a whole booklet of things, of decisions that they have to take with each other. Mm -hmm. Completely relaxed atmosphere. And, and it, how it was explained by people to me was that they did say, yeah, well, you know, if we lose, then we try it next year again. So becoming and better losers in a way. Better losers <laughs> and because, because sometimes you win and sometimes yeah. you lose. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to go to the room because I saw two hands. Yes, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yes, thank you. I'm Sultur Mobila from the Transnational Institute. Thanks to all the panelists for this discussion. Um, I, I, I accept this vision of defining populist as a political strategy in terms of 
drawing a line between the people against the establishment. Um, but also, I think it's useful to see populism as a political moment, mm -hmm. as a political moment where the limit of the possible is expanded. So, and this has been mentioned briefly before, so what are the conditions that allow a project based on people against establishment to be possible? So what are these conditions? And we haven't heard too much, Lucia touched a bit on the economic conditions, no? So we had 11 years ago the economic and financial crisis with a very clear uh, vast majority of people affected, the 99% of Occupy Wall Street or the 15M, and a very small majority who didn't pay off. Actually, we had to pay off with austerity measures, privatizations, etc. This is where populism had a space sure. to, to expand. And you see that uh, populism started to question what made this system work, trade, trade and investment agreements or the European Union policies. So Syriza said, well, actually, the EU is forcing us to impose austerity, and we are using anti-riot police and tear gas against our own people because the Troika is telling us to do that. Sure. So then there was an anti-EU feeling. Sure. In France, Le Pen is also against EU because they feel the borders are too open. So uh, I would like to, to stress that fact. No? The, the populist moment is happening, but it will finish. And when it's finished, we will have a new normal. And the danger is that the new normal is a European Union that passed the, the challenge of the last European elections, where right-wing populists and nationalists didn't win so much. But the EU that we have maybe in three or five years is an EU with militarized borders, where migrants and refugees are expelled, and human rights are not respected. And this is when some populists have, will actually won, mm -hmm. because some populists have this project. It's a racist supremacist project that they want to implement, and they see, see the opportunity as other leftists see the opportunity to bring back power to the people from the banks and the big corporations. So okay, but then so so that relates actually to to the question that was being asked before. Like, is this part of a of a of a process of a longer process that 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 that, that is an element of? But then the big question is, of course, what we're working towards and what these forces are pushing us towards is that in fact an improved version of our democratic institution or is it uh, 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 backsliding it, right? So that that is then, I think, the, the question of can we steer or is populism helping us come to this improved version um, uh, of, of our democracy or are we are we actually being pushed in a, in a different uh, direction? But maybe one of the panelists would like to react to what I Saul mean, maybe said. just briefly, I think the fact that so, for example, the well, yeah, Barcelona is a good example always. But the point is that once you arrive to the institutions, if you don't manage to change the structures, if you don't manage to change the democratic system that make it more a direct democracy, then you're I actually still in the same. You're playing the same with the same cards, right? So, as much as you try to change uh, from the institutions, you really need to pay a lot of attention to change the whole structure and to change the the system, which then you have to challenge with major forces like the EU and other forces that some parties are not that disposed to, to do, right? Like, for example, now in Spain, again, um, it is good that Podemos is in the government, but it's in a very fragile major minority government. So actually, we are seeing already some not movements of things that they actually said they were going to do, and they not being able to do it because they're actually being very pressured no? down. So, but maybe just to like to continue what Sol was saying, um, it's true that Podemos played also this game of uh, trying to draw, erase the line between we're not left, we're not right, mm -hmm. we are anti-establishment, we're like from below to uh, you know like people to well down from up, okay. and the one percent, and yeah, so that's I don't know, that's not necessarily like is it good, bad to separate are we right, are we left, and just concentrate on the anti-establishment. But the main difference is that Podemos actually has a social agenda and a progressive program. So that might be the major point of difference with other um, ways of trying to, you know, like being a populist where you use some points of a social agenda, but you actually have very liberal uh, policies with ultranationalist um, perspective, right? Yeah, well? maybe if I could very briefly follow up. I mean, the European dimension, according to me, is essential. And uh, particularly because there's a new commission that, uh, well, I won't say very bad things about it, but in certain ways it doesn't look that good. But on the other hand, it promoted this conference on the future of Europe, 
on which a lot of, I wouldn't call them populist, and again, we could, should go back to definitions, but rather democratizing popular forces like DN25 and many others now, uh, Agora yeah. Europe, etc., yeah, yeah. um, that are saying, okay, you, you set up a conference on the future of Europe, where according to some of the definitions of some of the institutions, the whole purpose is to, in, to, to drag in the people mm -hmm. and to, to discuss together and to even define together the, the future uh, uh, teleology, so to speak, of the, of the European Union, but where you then set up something that doesn't correspond in any way to that. Mm -hmm. So this is the moment in a way, but mm -hmm. it's, it's like Podemos in Spain, DiEM25 uh, on the European level uh, doesn't add up to much electoral cloud and so on. And so, uh, I mean, maybe it's not the populist, but it's definitely a strong claim for different types of bottom-up channels for serious mm -hmm. popular uh, investment and engagement. Nicole, I, I'm just going to yeah, get one more question and then... Well, one, one line I want to add to what Paul said. One line? That is the main task that for for the moderate parties to to make this possible and to be um, uh, willing to change to make those changes and and that will that will not uh, um, I said that that will be a good answer to populism I'm so con convinced about that you also had a question if you can introduce yourself please yeah my name is Paula I'm an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam here in European law and I wanted to, as I'm reading the panel, like you're saying that one of the innovations of populism can be channeling more bottom-up voices, more direct democracy. So I wanted to push back a bit to be provocative because uh, when we see uh, Switzerland, what you brought as an example, they voted also re in a referendum to include in, a co in the constitution a prohibition to build minarets in Switzerland. No. Probably a question if you submit to a referendum in many other European countries would have come out the same way. But I would say that's a very then mild form of plenty nothing about getting rid of the Muslims. Appenzella, what you mentioned, gave women the voting rights in 1992. So how do you make sure, include that safeguards <laughs> that there is diversity, that there is inclusion in, uh, in those systems as well? Yeah. You know, you have the popular consultations. I don't know, the European Union has been doing this a lot and promoting this as their public consultations on issues lately on daylight saving time, abolishing daylight saving time. 90% of the people participating in the consultation were German, yes, out of the whole European Union. So basically, what kind of mechanisms do we need to include more diversity? And citizenship would be another dividing line that... Fair, fair point. Is that, uh, yeah, not completely fair. Mm. <coughs> <laughs> uh, of course, I hear that very often, but I always say that if, if, if the autonomy on local level in the Netherlands would be at the same level as it was in Switzerland, then in Stophorst and in many other very religious uh, local counties, we w the women would not have any voting rights. So that doesn't make Switzerland so different. Only the fact is that they had so much strong local autonomy. So there was this one or two maybe cantons that were um, uh, not including women. That doesn't say anything about the system. That says a lot about the conservative people that live in those county counties. And they live everywhere. Yeah. Um, Secondly, I totally agree with you when you say that European is doing these panels, but that's not that's for me not a living democracy. In a living democracy, debate should be involved. I'm struggling with the fact that the European Union now, uh, the, the Commission, is thinking about this future of the, the Europe conferences. We did a campaign which was called Now the Citizens, uh, with a lot of NGOs uh, all through Europe, for, for NGOs that are all working on democracy improvement. And we have, we have quite a big debate now because what is brought forth is this sortition principle of David van Rijbroek, uh, loting in Dutch, sortition, uh, balloting, you can also say it. So at randomly choosing people from the different countries to be part of this conference on the future of Europe. The problem there, I'm, I'm not against it, um, but the problem there is it doesn't create a public debate. Uh, not on the scale which a referendum does. So where we're looking now for is to combine it. And then I think the, the Commission as also the European Parliament is much stronger advocate of that, in including giving the citizens a real position in those conference, in that conference, um, that could be combined with, in the end, uh, uh, well, there is no such thing as a European demos, uh, I would say, but 
try to create a kind of a meaningful uh, a referendum would be too far, I think. I would be in favor of that, but a meaningful poll with discussions on the outcomes of this uh, future uh, conference. That would be some step in the direction. And that would also kill some of the populist movements that will say Europe is far away, Europe gives, gives no say to any uh, citizens' uh, participation. Okay, so then basically, the, the b because we need to round up, so the, but the, the most important thing is to, m if, we, if we look at populism and the effect that populism has, be it positive or negative, uh, of course, always still in the eye of the beholder, but um, is that uh, uh, we need to at least try to to cr make it a force that doesn't divide, but that brings back the debate into the, the, the that put, puts the conversation back on the table, uh, activating people that maybe d before that were not uh, active politically speaking. Um, in order to, in that sense, restore uh, the system uh, that also uh, allows for populism to uh, arise and also damage the system in itself. So uh, that's that's sort of if if we need to put it in this frame eh, of populism as a, a form of democratic innovation, then the way to to make it at least part of the solution is to bring back the the the, the debate. Uh, and the people, uh, is it not right? only the debate, but also the, the, um, the, uh, to give them a say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Uh, um, one one oh. last remark. Yeah. Yeah. The last remark. Okay. This, is, this is your last <laughs> remark. That's yes. Such a pressure. Because it's ten o'clock. No, no, no. I just have the feeling that maybe we have posed the debate too much into populism and democracy, like in an institutional kind of sense, mm. which. I think it's very limited also in its own because like I don't know like like we who come also from the trade movements like we have also seen like you know like how you can yeah of course like engage so many sectors into talking about some type of politics that they thought were not capable of doing because we have also become some kind of technocrats sometimes like NGOs and especially also sometimes activists you know talking about some subjects so, you know, like populism also thinking of it as a popular way of talking of some topics to to a yeah. form of leadership, I don't know, yeah. to to come the conversation to get nearer to some yeah. sectors. That is actually the hegemony that we also want to to win with some of our activist campaigns, such as a as a trade movement. Yeah. So so I I mean I don't want this to be the final remark, but <laughs> no, 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 this is gonna be okay. your final <laughs> remark. That's a difference. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, this is just like one uh, one example that can, I think, be yeah. clearly this used. This is no? one of the cracks in the system that you think should be should be improved. Yeah, and I, I yeah. mean, I don't know. It's just like this rephrasing of like we represent the people. No, like I think people represent themselves, and and the institutions could be a mechanism to put forward some of the mm -hmm. some of the proposals. But it's not the only mechanism. And actually, this has been proved. No, like like how. And we, we cannot say like all these movements, like even with Podemos, if they put forward a, a policy on house evictions, it's not really, there. it is because there's a social movement behind, right? If we talk about trade and TTIP and CETA, it is because there's a social movement behind. Mm -hmm. And the parties react to that social movement, left, right. Mm, I mean, that's what we have experienced in our own sense, right? So, so yeah, so I would just like to also put the, the uh, debate on the people as a strength by themselves without yeah. the need of any institution. Okay, thank you. Uh, a big thank you to the, to the panel. Um, the, the, the clock is, is ticking and ticking and uh, we're a little bit over time, but I hope you can stay for us just for this final reflection um, uh, by our last speaker. Uh, and that is uh, uh, Sarah de Lange. She's a professor by special appointment at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Sarah, please please come forward for these last minutes that we're gonna grasp. I'm gonna give you a mic. I don't think we yeah. need to be on the stage for this, but um, you have been asked to share your critical mind on this conversation tonight and, and well, maybe 
yeah, summarize or give some observations that you made or uh, that you heard or that, that you think that were not made at all and that you really, we cannot leave this room before this is heard. So um, what, what, what's, what stuck out for you? Well, uh, as you said at the start, we're, we were going into this with as much of an open mind as possible. But I think that at the end of the day, we have come to the conclusion that perhaps the negatives of populism outweigh the po positives. And I think there's some very good reasons for that. Um, you know, it's absolutely true that some of the democratic backsliding that we're currently witnessing is not due to populism, but it's due to nativism and it's due to authoritarianism. But nevertheless, populism in itself, because it does exactly what the gentleman who was the first one to ask a question, because it assumes that the people are somehow unified, have shared interests, shared political preferences, shared uh, values, um, because of that notion, it is inherently anti-pluralist. Um, and um, it therefore can both affect uh, our institutions uh, and actors, so it can affect the independence of the judiciary, of the media, but also of other actors that we haven't really touched upon, such mm -hmm. as uh, scholars, uh, artists, uh, NGOs, uh, who all become constrained in their actions. I think because of that mechanism, it also has some very uh, different effects that, that Paul briefly touched upon, namely on society. And I think those we should also be very concerned about. So one is that indeed populism, because it creates an us versus them, us the good people versus them the bad elite, contributes to polarization, and especially to effective polarization, where you don't see the other anymore as your opponent, your political opponent, mm. but as your enemy, um, it can have some, some serious impact on uh, cohesion in society, on stability, etc. But I think it also does something else, which is that it presents citizens with a very particular vision on democracy, and it impacts their thinking about what democracy is and what it does for them. And there was a very nice example last week in the Dutch media where one of the leaders of the Farmers Defense Force said, well, I've sort of given up on democracy because as farmers, we are a minority. So in democracy, we will never win. But that's a very majoritarian way of thinking about what democracy is and what it does. And there's good reasons why we have a liberal democracy in which minorities are actually, to some extent, protected and have a chance to, perhaps at the next elections, when there's different alliances between different groups in society, become the majority. And I don't think there, that farmer realized that he was, would be way worse off in a <laughs> country like Poland or Hungary where he would always be relegated to the minority and would not have any rights as uh, opposed to our system. So that's a bit about sort of the, the, the challenges that populism brings with it. Yeah. Um, two other brief points I would like to make. Okay. Um, the first one is about the positives. And I think a lot of the positives of populism that have been mentioned are to some extent sort of byproducts of populist success. So, um, collateral damage. Uh, no, col positive collateral <laughs> damage. Uh, in the sense that uh, questioning the status quo, uh, integrating citizens, uh, reforming our political system, which is certainly not functioning well, does not need to be done by populist actors. It can be done by all kinds of other actors as well. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a populist to challenge the status quo. What you do need, and uh, this is something I think we're lacking and it hasn't been mentioned, is you need ideology, right? We need a re-ideologization of politics because there's simply not enough competing visions of our future. Uh, and therefore a willingness to challenge the status quo and truly reform our systems. And then lastly, and this is sort of the pessimistic note I am afraid I'm going to have to uh, end uh, on. You're going to end with the pessimistic yes. one. Okay. So <laughs> something very important that was said was about protests. And that protest in the case where populism already has majority status 
merely slows down the process, it's unable to re reverse it. Yeah. Um, the metaphor and I of the clock. The metaphor of the clock. Mm -hmm. And I think that metaphor is very important because it means we can't expect the citizens in countries in which populism already has majority status to really fundamentally change things. We need international institutions and other nations for that, and they're terribly failing at that at the moment. And the other thing is that we need to realize in countries where populism is still in opposition in minority status, that that is the phase in which you, know, you can still defend your institutions and defend your liberal democratic values. And if you wait too long, it is too late. So it's very much about the timing and sort of the trajectory that you follow. Um, if you feel the need to act, now is the moment and not maybe a couple of elections later. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> the time is up. So uh, I thank you all. Um, big thank you to all the speakers. Big thank you, of course, uh, also to Ben and Alvaro who uh, uh, organized this. Um, big thank you to all of you for, for being here and for, for participating. Um, uh, sometimes I had to laugh a little bit in, in the sense that we are next week we have a, an event together with Bas Hein who wrote a book basically uh, discussing the, the future of our liberal democracy and uh, well several people but Sarah you at the end you sort of summarized this booklet for us in where the core of the problem is so uh, I, I invite all of you who do speak Dutch unfortunately this one is in Dutch to, to please join us to continue this conversation because um, I think we can all agree that we're not we're not there yet we're not done we didn't solve it uh, uh, and that might bring us a, a step further uh, but we also have a couple of other uh, really nice events coming up so I hope you will and join us <gasps> oh yeah Nisko but come here then okay <laughs> Niska also has an event next week. Yes, the United, mic Sorry. Because otherwise you're the United <laughs> Streets of Amsterdam next week, uh, yeah. Tuesday evening. In Dutch? We, in, in, Dutch. Yeah. in Dutch, sorry. Yeah. But we can make, make a translation maybe. Um, but that's uh, what we're going to do is to see if it's possible to organize in the 4,662 streets of Amsterdam that every street chooses or through balloting, comes up with a representative of the street, and they will have a meeting once a year with an agenda point that's brought up bottom up to decide on that issue. That's why we want to explore the pros and cons, yeah. but that's next Tuesday, you're very welcome. So next Tuesday. Uh, if you look on the website, you will find all these events. Thanks again, have a really great uh, evening. Uh, have a drink downstairs in the bar and, and continue the conversation. Good night.